Is Ted still out sick? He's back. I know he's on another call probably right up to the to the hour here so yeah i saw him here just in a meeting this afternoon no worries i just uh was hoping that he was doing better he is um still being very careful um masking around others and uh probably trying to do as much work from his office as opposed to face-to-face <laughs> -face meetings he's clear to come back to work though after some Right. Discussions with the, the pros. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining in this afternoon. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, December 6th. Um, uh, Des Moines Waterworks Planning Committee meeting, and we'll have folks introduce themselves as uh, they speak. Um, first item on our agenda is the RFP process competitive bid approach. Andrea, uh, I, I think, uh, I hope that you find this topic very interesting. Um, it, the, the board has challenged us in, in recent months to uh, find um, more creative ways, more competitive ways to to bid our projects in, in these uh, times when we're um, seeing uh, a higher prices, a lot of competition for contractors, extended delivery times and extended contract times. And I think our engineering group has done a great job. I think Lindsay's gonna do most of the presenting, but I'm gonna hand it over to Mike McKernan first, to just give us a quick background on um, what we're gonna hear today. And then I'm sure he will hand it off to Lindsay. So Mike, take it. Yeah, yeah. perfect, Ted, thank you. I'll be brief. Um, yeah, some of these recent efforts are I guess, motivated by some comments from the board about, is there anything we can do differently? Are there some creative things we can do? Uh, those kind of started on the construction contract award side of this conversation. Um, interestingly, uh, Lindsay joined us here in August from Iowa State University and has worked on a lot of facility projects across multiple utility operations, has worked basically, you know, under the umbrella of the Board of Regents. And so there's this perspective that she's brought here that is valuable now on two fronts that we would like to share with the board and kind of give them a better understanding of 
there are some things we can do different and they would likely align us um, a little more closely with, with, with the way the rest of the you know, municipal world is likely operating. And so we wanna talk about two things today. One is on the professional services side. Uh, how can we go about acquiring consultations, engineering firms to help with engineering work? So we're gonna talk about those professional services agreements and how we get into those. She's got great information on that. And then we will move into those construction contracts and some of the flexibility we might have there as well in regard to how we accomplish some of our work. So we've got some, I don't know, Lindsay, I'm guessing we got about 12, 12 minutes or so of so great information. Uh, we can answer questions along the way or we can certainly have time at the end. So I'd like to lateral to Lindsay Wanderscheid. Uh, again, she joined us just here in August and she's got some great information here today. Before you get started, um, I, I see Alec is on, but I don't think any other board members are on. Um, is, is this information, um, is the intention to share this again with the larger board or just a report out of, these, of this committee meeting? And, Andrea, I would say that we don't have this presentation scheduled for a full board meeting. Um, I know that um, Graham had in, intended to, to join us today. He was very interested, but uh, he texted me recently that he's tied up. I think what I would propose is we share the recording. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's something we can actually send to the board and they can just watch the recording because I do think it'll be valuable information and interesting for them to see. So that'd be my thought. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that uh, that everybody was going to hear this since I, I know that it has been a, a question asked by some of the other folks that, that aren't on this call today. So great, I think the recording one would be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen here and then um, I have just a short presentation that we'll go through on these topics. Um, can you see that? Um, we're seeing the presenter's view, Lindsay. There How about go. now? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so I just put together a little agenda, but basically, as Mike mentioned, we'll talk about two things today. Um, the, the consultant selection process, I'll talk a little bit about what we currently do, and then some potential ways to be more efficient. We'll talk about some indefinite scope agreement possibilities, doing things multiple years, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, public improvements versus non-public improvements. So, so first of all, here is our existing consultant selection process. So on a lower fee, you know, we just will sign an agreement, but then as it gets higher, um, we do like a request to professional firms and then an RFP process. So when we do the RFP, you know, we have multiple um, professionals that come um, look at the site. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is kind of what we the board has seen in the past on what our process currently is. So as far as the existing consultant, just to kind of dive into that a little bit. So we'll do an RFP request for proposal for studies or preliminary engineering, get somebody hired, and then we'll do additional um, RFPs for design or or we scope out the whole project and do one RFP at one time. So when we do that, we have to send it out to multiple people. And so then we get a lot of people that come in to walk through the project. You know, they, a lot of the consultants don't like to um, just give you a proposal. So they're gonna want to come look at it. So it takes a lot of time and effort, even on smaller projects to, to do this RFP. And then you might do it multiple times in a project, right? Because um, you might get that preliminary engineering so and done, and then you um, go through with design or whatever. You might have to do some initial studies. So 
it just takes the consultant a lot of time and money to put together those proposals. And then what we do is we'll evaluate it based on qualifications, but then we also base it somewhat on the, the costs also. So that usually it's a matrix that we do to evaluate it. So once you get somebody on board, then we get their terms and conditions and go through that legal process. So that takes a lot of time and attention to go through all of that. And then if you have a consultant that might be coming at design rather than maybe preliminary design or the study, it's just a lot of a learning curve for them to, and it takes more time and is less efficient. So kind of to talk more about this, why are we looking to change? So historically, Des Moines Waterworks, you know, we do most of our design ourselves with the new CIP for the five year, we're gonna, you know, we've talked about these levers and, and using consultants more to help us complete our projects. And then with the city of Des Moines having additional funding, they're also completing a lot of projects. And so it's taking up some of our time. So if we're, if we're focusing on getting those projects out, then we have less time for, you know, our internal projects. So we just have to try to be as much more efficient try to save time as much as we can. And we also want to get the most qualified consultants to complete the work. So, you know, so you get a good end product that's going to be maintained easy and operate well for the production staff. You also want to build relationships. So, you know, getting better teamwork, they get more familiar with um, Des Moines Waterworks processes and familiarity, and so it will take less time. They become more of like a extension of your staff. So they get, they get used to our standards. And then the only other thing I have to offer here is the costs. With the, if you try to scope out a project, there's a lot of question marks. Um, you know, you may not know it at the time, like exactly what you're designing. And so consultants will, will put in dollars for those question marks if there's some things they don't know. So we, we think that this will help us reduce our costs um, because the scope will be better known. So the other thing we want to mention is, you know, in July of this year, they actually talked about the, the um, Iowa state of Iowa came out and I, on this highlighted here, the fee-based selection of an engineer for public improvement shall be prohibited. Now we are in compliance with that because really it's solely based on fees, but as you can see, it's getting to be more common to not base it just on, on the fees. And they, in fact, they don't want us to just base it on fees on the selection. So here's our proposed selection. So this would be for larger project budgets. So instead of doing the request for proposal where we scope out the entire project, we would do a request for qualifications. And so that's really um, asking for their resumes, asking for a project similar, that sort of thing, and then do the interviews and select the team. And then basically we would hire them for a study or preliminary design and negotiate a fee. So it, that way we would get the most qualified um, the qualified team to do the work. And then you just do that for the initial study or preliminary design, get an agreement finalized, executed, and then go on with your work. And then before you get done with that, oops, excuse me, sorry. Uh, before you get done with that work, you might decide, oh, okay, we wanna continue on with, we know what the costs are now and we wanna go on to the design. And so you would just do an amendment, get the fee and then bring it to the board for approval. So you just basically, you know, it'll help reduce costs, but the intent would be to stay with that team until the project's complete, rather than do, you know, utilize them for preliminary design and then go to the, um, go to somebody else to do the design. So for example, you know, with our, most recent project with the Sailorville expansion, you know, we hired HDR Black and Beach team to do the preliminary design. Um, in this case, we would just do an amendment rather than build that whole RFP, add that, you know, months of work that we could have saved by just working with HDR. So that's on the large projects. Then on the smaller projects for less than a million, we would propose to do a IDIQ. Um, also people call this like on-call delivery. So it's indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. So you do that for a fixed time, 
but you use it really when you don't know exactly the services you need. So uh, people like DOT and things like that that are doing roadways or uh, geotechnical services where you don't know exactly where you're gonna need, you can utilize this. And this would basically help streamline the contract process um, and speed up you know, how, how you can get the work completed. So the intent would be kind of multiple firms and disciplines. So I just put a couple down on the screen, but um, I've kind of been working on this a little bit and it could really be greater than even these ones on the screen. So um, surveying, you know, we can just, if we don't have staff time to do surveying and creating base maps, you know, we would be able to call up and, and uh, get these people in place to do the work. So. So how that would look is we would do similar thing as on the agreements now, you know, with the request for quals um, and then do interviews and select team. What they do after that, if you select them, they'll provide you their certificate of insurance and they'll provide you their hourly rates and fees. So you have those on file. And really then you get this agreement in place. You've done all of the paperwork, all the contracting, and then you can just use them as an as needed basis. So you don't really have to tell them how many projects you're working on. It doesn't really warrant them that they will get the work. It's just that it's in place. And how we did it, I would say we had a three-year contract option to renew for two one-year periods. So this was very common. In fact, we went to do this a lot at Iowa State with structural engineering, utility engineering. Um, you know, we, we had multiple commissioning. We had a I don't know, 15 maybe, uh, and we had two or three for each, each type of work. And basically then you kind of can call them up. Let's say I have a project to uh, do a scale, truck scale, let's see, that's on our list for our CFP. I would just call somebody up, get a proposal from the civil consultants and then go through the scope, negotiate it. And then we basically would just release it. So it just will save time. Um, and uh, you can get things done quicker. So you would have multiple firms that you could call in case there was a, a time problem. Yeah, so they sometimes they may or... be um, too busy to take on. So the advantage of having multiple is that if you only have one, they may not have staff available. You know, they might not have resources. So we always had two or three to choose from in each category. And, um, and then also we would try to split the work. So like if I, I had one for like air permitting um, and I had two people and so I would do a project, I might call the one, the next time I might call the other one. So try to split it up and be fair. Do but, those, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do those agreements guarantee a certain amount of dollar work or anything like that? No. Okay. No, we would, I mean, we would put like an estimate of we think, but it really wasn't like a guaranteed amount or anything like that. Thank you. Yeah. You know. But yeah, indefinite scope. Um, I did look just, there's a lot of other cities that are doing the indefinite scope. They call it on call. There's people that do it differently. So like Iowa City has one out right now. Um, they have an RFQ, they ask for like billing rates and they kind of use that to um, determine who they pick, I guess. So, cause some, some firms may have higher fees, you know, than others. Um, but like Altoona, they tied it to their CIP and they asked for people to submit qualifications and then they'll get people on board to help them with their five-year CIP. So th there's a lot of different people. I know Iowa State does it. Um, then the Board of Regents, you know, Iowa, you and I, and the DOT does this. So it's it's not uncommon for this to, to occur. Right. And I want to just recognize John's comment that he shared here with us that Des Moines Waterworks actually does do this already for our legal services. Thanks, John. Yep. Okay, so that's what I had on the consultant and the PSAs. Um, so I'll move on to the contracting side of things. So um, typically on our existing contracts, you know, we do them on an annual basis, kind of this budget year time frame. you know, follow 
our formal process. So we do that approval to solicit bids, approval to award bids. And just every time we do this formal bid, there's a lot of contract administration and time to develop our front end documents and getting it out for bid. So I wanted to talk a little bit about just public improvements versus non-public. So right now, anything over 100,000, we handle as a public improvement. So we follow all those formal processes, as I mentioned. And some of the examples of projects, and Andrea, I'm sure you've seen um, some of these because they're reoccurring, like the basin rechaining, the well rehab, filter media. And, and we just would question if those are really public improvements. So I went to the code just to get the definition of what they consider a public improvement. And it really excludes construction or repair or maintenance work when it's related to our existing infrastructure. So that infrastructure can be treatment, it can be generation, distribution of water and all the other public utilities. So really if it's a maintenance or repair, it's really not considered a public improvement. It's just really maintaining what you already have. So, and that's how we handled a lot of our work at Iowa State. So like even like tank painting, for example, right now we would bid that through a formal bid process. Um, I would tell you I've painted tanks and I just bid it through, a, it's still competitive, but it's an RFP process. And then you don't have some of those formalities and things. And some of those contractors that do that work aren't really familiar with those processes anyway. But we, what where we would say is bid it through this competitive RFP, similar to how we procure some of our engineering services and just um, consider you know, what's replacement capital versus the public improvement. And obviously it's public improvement, we would follow all those formalities. And this would just allow us to evaluate costs and qualifications. Uh, we also could even, you know, like I mentioned with the well rehab where we, where we do the, you know, periodically, we could bid those out multiple years. So like um, you could have a well rehab contract that might span five years rather than one, and you'd already have costs from the contractor. You might get better pricing, you know, which we've talked about and more interest. So rather than one bidder, you might get multiple because now they can, you know, put you on the schedule um, and you, basically you're giving them a base, base load of work. So, so that will help. Plus in the budgeting process, we would already know those numbers. And then the other thing with the contracting this way is you get familiar, the contractor gets familiar with what equipment you have and dealing with the people and our processes and things like that. So it just saves time and is more efficient. So that's kind of what all I have, um, just a summary of kind of what we would like to recommend moving forward is, you know, our larger projects over a million do that RFQ amendment process, but utilizing that consultant, you know, we're going to do the competitiveness up front and then utilize them throughout the project. Less than a million, we'd like to look into these indefinite scope agreements and getting some people on board to um, help us, especially like when we have projects that pop up for the city or other things, having being agile and having these people to help us will, you know, we only have so much staff time available. And then bidding these multiple year maintenance projects through competitive RFP, and then just the non-public improvement, consider what we really, uh, what is a public improvement? And if it's not, you know, do we need to do all the formality and the public hearings and things like that? So that's kind of our summary. And I guess I'll just open it up for any questions anybody has. Just uh, <clears throat> maybe a, a comment on the um, use of the public bidding law uh, and procedures. Uh, historically, I think, uh, we've taken a, a fairly conservative view of whether or not we should subject certain projects to uh, the public bidding procedures. Um, Lindsay's right, though, in pointing to the code. There was an amendment uh, that was um, uh, went into effect um, July 1 of 2020, uh, which contains that language about um, work on existing infrastructure. And I think the 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 contours of that or the boundaries of, of what constitutes existing infrastructure um, may be a little bit gray. 
Uh, but certainly some of the projects that I think Lindsay's talking about where we're, you know, doing well rehab, rechaining, uh, these types of, of clearly, I think, maintenance related projects um, probably don't need to go through the public bidding law uh, procedure. And, you know, I don't think there's been a reason really to reevaluate that process up until now, but now there are practical reasons why I think that's that's worth considering. Um, so that's kind of our our take on the legal the legal background here. Um, one other note I'd make is that currently the board policy manual, um, you know, just talks about following the public bidding procedures for public improvements. So it it just whatever the code requires a public improvement, you know, the board policy basically adopts that. Um, if if we're going to deviate, uh, not deviate, if we're going to sort of adopt a new set of procedures. One thing I think would be a good idea, especially as we start out, is for the board to perhaps establish another policy dealing with the things that Lindsay's talking about. So the board understands what's happening at the utility and probably answer some questions that staff may have about um, when board authorization is going to be required uh, going forward. Because if the goal here is to streamline it, um, you know, we don't want to have to be coming back to the board on issues that the board thinks the staff should be, you know, able to make decisions on. So, John, are you uh, suggesting that a board policy manual update would be needed before we made these changes or would be appropriate to ensure the board's awareness? Um, I think if if you wanted to start, you know, putting out proposals for, um, uh, you know, uh, service providers on an as needed basis, you know, you probably could do that. Um, I think the the issue for the board is going to be where uh, where does their authorization come in, um, you know, and and I'm kind of the ongoing service provider model. Um, typically, we don't require the board to approve those uh, expenditures if they're individually uh, less than 100,000 100, or less than the, the, the spending authority. Um, wanna make sure that that's consistent with what the board's expectations are going forward if we're gonna start providing more, um, more services you know, on that model. Understood. So I, I think I, I look at this as not as much an authority issue as, as to, to help streamline the process and make sure that the board understands what it's authorizing um, when it when it says go forward with uh, you know some of these proposals. That that makes sense, and I think is in the same vein of what we're trying to do here with eliminating you know uh, unnecessary um, approvals and going back and forth and people's times and and make people's time and making things able to just move forward smoother. So appreciate you bringing that up. Do you have any thoughts on Ted or Mike or two Lindsay? Oops. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> two observations for me. One is I think this is ideal timing with all of the expansion projects that we have coming on, coming up related to regional governance. I think, um, having an engineering team that can work, you know, through each of those projects from start to finish instead of doing what we've done um, historically, which is, you know, get a proposal to do the preliminary engineering and get a proposal to do the engineering and get a proposal, uh, you know, maybe to do the study before the preliminary engineering. And I think this is ideal timing for that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get that to work. The other thing that struck me just now is, as Lindsay was describing, um, some of the contractors who do these, you know, maintenance and repair sorts of work, not being used to that formal process, you know, we have struggled endlessly with getting the contractors to meet what we felt were very simple requirements in terms of the public bidding process. And maybe part of that problem was that they just weren't used to doing it, doing all of that rigor, you know, hey, here's our price, we'll do the work if we're low, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's been part of our challenge all, all along. I don't know, but simplifying it um, while we're still being competitive and we're getting multiple prices uh, could present, could provide a lot of value and interest more people in our work, frankly. 
Yeah, I, I was to, sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead Andrea. No, 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 go ahead. Well, I just in response to John, I think this would require a little more thought in regard to maybe how to communicate, you know, what the board is really approving here. I, I think with what a lot of what Lindsay shared, there would be all there were these numerous opportunities where certain things would happen where you know, we've got something that's over $100,000, whether it's a professional services agreement or, um, you know, some sort of, you know, contracted work over, over you know, the general manager spending authority. You know, anything over that general manager's authority is probably going to need to come to a board meeting. And a uh, small plug for maybe increasing uh, the general manager's spending authority. Um, it's been 100000 for a long, long time, but that's, that's a different topic. So I think a lot of what Lindsay presented, there would be this natural mechanism where we would, we would find ourselves in a spot where, okay, we need to, we've got this negotiated now, if it's 150 or $250,000 or a million dollars, you know, we need to bring that to the board and explain to them why we're comfortable and confident. So my first reaction to John's kind of comments and questions, were, I'm not sure that would be difficult for us to you know, pencil out in a, in a board policy manual. So I, I think that's a hurdle we can clear with, with the right focused effort. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, the, like the thresholds, Lindsay, that you were using a million dollars, for example, you know, that's, that's the kind of threshold that you would put into the policy manual and say, if it's going to be a, a professional services engagement with multiple phases, um, you know, that, that, that you would require that, that entire initial engagement to be approved, even if the the first phase of it's going to be maybe twenty five thousand dollars, but you think the whole project, if it goes through, um, you know, I, I I defer to you folks on on exactly how to define those phases and and what you're trying to aim at. But I think it's important for the board to have that understanding of when contracts are being executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just sitting here as we were talking, um, created like a flow flow diagram of the process, like for indefinite scope. As, um, and it basically will say, you know, projects less than a million dollars. This is what we're how we're going to handle it. And then I have one for the opposite for projects over a million. So I already have those kind of developed and, you know, how I have those steps that I mentioned and walked through. There's actually a flow chart of how we would handle it. So maybe that's something that we can share. Lynn, Lindsay, are you saying you've got a flow chart that would say, you know, arrow toward board approval or uh, obtain board approval? Is it that? Well, it doesn't that say granular? that. It just says the process. But, but we, you know, anything over a certain amount we're going to take. So we can help, help modify that. So I'll just okay. show you, for example, like this is... I was gonna see, can you see that? Yep. Okay, so this basically says, you know, this outlines the process, how we're gonna follow it less than a million and kind of how we're gonna handle it and then give the notice to proceed. So we can add something in there about just the threshold of, you know, when the board needs to approve it or see it. So that's what I'm saying. And and is it, Lindsay, is it your anticipation that, you know, you, you you know, for these indefinite scope, you pre-qualify or not pre-qualify, but you 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 would do an assessment. And you would recommend to the board that we enter into contracts with two or three contractors, and then the policy would could be some version of you know, um, DMWW is permitted to enter into contracts uh, or engagements with X, provided they're within the CEO spending authority. Um, going forward. So the board would approve the initial engagement of the contractor, and then, you know, assuming that that they're not charging more than the CEO spending authority, um, you know, they that that process would continue. You you'd you'd use them as needed, um, unless you you went over the the individual spending authority. Yeah, I uh, I'm just struggling a little bit on like these indefinite scopes. I don't think we ever brought it to our board, honestly. But I mean, I whatever the board would like us to do, you know, as far in Ted and what your guys' recommendation, but I don't think we actually had to get approval to enter in those contracts. I think though, like if we had an agreement that was over the threshold, but also our thresholds were 
a lot higher too. So, right. um, you know, it was our senior vice president for operations and finance that would sign off on a lot of these agreements. So I guess I'll just say that a lot um, of what or well, everything that you just shared makes makes a lot of sense um, to me and and would it you know and in fact probably streamline the process a little a lot more um, because it does deal so much with you know with finance and uh, I'm already kind of hearing um, anticipating what some of my board colleagues might be might say and think and, and have thoughts on this. And so I'm just wondering if it's not necessarily something that we want to take to the full the pop the, these changes to the full board. Is it feasible to to share it maybe in the finance committee um, or something along that those lines? And then my other question is with those indefinite contracts, um, does that uh, um, I mean, would they, are they then our um, only available uh, consultant that we can use? Are we, is that some, is there some sort of include exclusion clause there or can we decide we don't want to work with any yeah. of them and go someplace else? Okay. That's how we handled it, Andrea, is we would, we had those that we would work with, but honestly, um, you know, we could go use someone else if they didn't have the qualifications that we needed or were too busy or okay. whatever. Yeah. It was pretty open. Andrea, we, we can do a couple of different things and, and we probably don't have to decide today. We, we could take this to finance and audit so that more of the board could see the presentation. Another thought I had was that maybe we could consider what we believe the board policy manual changes should be to support these approaches. And that would obviously come to the full board for consideration. Sure. <clears throat> I'm just trying to think of whether, you know, the other board members would appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion with, with Lindsay and John uh, before we were making decisions on a board policy manual. And um, they may well, mm -hmm. so we can kind of take the temperature of the board and see if they'd like to see this at finance and audit. Um, it, it, it might be easier. It's always easier to comment on, on something in sort of it sketched out form too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not, um, I, I could try to take what Lindsay's put together and, and work with her to sketch out what the policy manual would look like. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that the, that the staff wouldn't have the authority now not to um, engage in some of these, these contractual relationships. Um, but I think because it's a departure to some degree of what the board is accustomed to in the past, um, it, it would make sense for the board to have an understanding of, of exactly how we're going to obtain these services going forward uh, so that there's no questions about um, uh, authority or, or just general questions. I mean, I, I, think, I think it serves a couple of purposes. Maybe, John, if, if that's something that you could sketch up what the board policy might look like, we could review and consider that. And then we can make the decision of whether that's a, that is a presentation to finance and audit, um, or if it's something we want to take to the full board. And we can, we can give that a little thought. We don't have to decide today. Sure. That's, that sounds great. I think that's a great path forward. Sounds good. Um, any, any other questions or thoughts on this topic? Okay. I'm not hearing any, so I'll turn it back again to you, Ted, for the CEO and general manager's comments. Andrea, my, my one comment today will just be a reminder that the, um, Finance and audit committee meeting that would have normally been on December 13th has been replaced with a full board meeting where we intend to um, review the, the next draft of the um, Central Iowa Waterworks uh, 2080 agreement with the board. So 
hopefully that's already on everyone's calendar and we're all looking forward to it. Sounds good. Um, and then last on our agenda is public comments. I do not think I see any public on the call. I would agree. Anybody correct me? Um, okay. So with that, I uh, will conclude our meeting for today and I appreciate all of your time joining on with us. Very good, thank you all. See you later.